so it's me again. Uh, I will just give you a short introduction to a time series. Uh, it's a temperature, annual temperature time series, and then Sanko Bitkonen will continue with the statistical analysis of the time series and especially the trend analysis and uh, in what comes to climate change and its detection. <coughs> so this is the time series that we are now talking about. It's the annual mean temperature of Finland. Uh, this is the longest that we can have. It starts from the mid-18th uh, uh, century. And, uh, so in this figure you can see the annual values and then the smoothed curve. And these envelopes around the smoothed curve, they represent uncertainties due to different uh, issues. The blue envelopes, they are related to the limited station network because in, in the mid-1800s, uh, we didn't have that many weather stations. So it is a bit uh, uncertain to, to, uh, to calculate the mean temperature of Finland. And the yellow envelopes, they are related to the homogenization adjustments that have been made for the weather observations and monthly, uh, the mean monthly temperatures. So this data series is based on gridded data. And, uh, so we have done gridded multi mean temperatures starting from 1847. And in the beginning, we had only six uh, stations. They are marked red in this map. Three of them are Finland, and then we have used also stations outside Finnish borders from Norway, Sweden, and Russia. And we have used homogenized multi temperatures so that uh, issues concerning with, uh, with the station relocations or instrument changes or changes in the uh, observing practices, they are not, um, or they should be taken care of already. And then the mean temperature comes, the Finland's mean temperature is the average over all the grid points. And we are using 10 kilometers resolution, so it's average over almost 4,000 4, grid points. And in this smaller figure, you can see the number of observation stations uh, in time. So in the beginning, there are only, only very few of them, less than 10. And then when we come to the 20th century, then it uh, start to, starts to grow. And of course, then the, uh, also the estimation of, of the mean temperature comes better. Uh, we use the geostatistical approach uh, called Kriging, called spatial uh, uh, estimation of the, of the grid data. And we have explanatory variables uh, such as the location and also the elevation of the terrain, and then the percentage of the sea, what's the share of the sea, and the uh, lake cover in the grid box. And these historical grid temperature data that we have done, they are used only for calculating spatial averages over the whole country, so we are not using the spatial data to, uh, like to look for the spatial, for the spatial distribution of the temperature, because they cannot be very good for that when we have only six stations or, uh, or so. And they are also used for uh, calculating annual and maybe seasonal values, but not, not really to go into more detail. When uh, calculating only with six, six stations and uh, with limited station network, uh, the mean temperature of Finland is not, uh, of course, as good as it comes when we have more stations. And we have evaluated the, the error that, we, that comes from the limited station network so that we have calculated the uh, 
to be in the picture in 1971 to 2000 with different station combinations and then uh, evaluated what is the, how big is the error that we have. And we see that with six stations, that is the red curve, uh, there's a very large standard deviation, which tells you that uh, the uncertainty is quite large in the mean temperature estimate. And that, that gave you the blue envelopes for the curve that I showed you first. But then when the station number gets higher, the estimates get better actually quite soon already. So that with 18, around 20 stations, you already have quite nice estimations. Typically, the estimations they became too cold, so that the uh, mean temperature estimated with limited number of stations it was too cold, and we had to correct that according to this kind of curve. And the uncertainty coming from the limited number of stations has also been, been estimated. And uh, taking, taking into account in the in the time series in this way, and it really comes comes down quite soon with six stations. It was almost one degree, but then with 20, 20 or 30 stations, it's 0 0.1 degree approximately. So this was a very short introduction for Santo, and now. We will continue with the statistics. Hi everyone. I'm Santa Mikkon. I'm from the University of Finland. And this is actually the title of a manuscript which is now in revision, has been for a while, which I've made with these people from the FMI. Right. So, the aim of the study was to take the changes in the mean temperature in Finland between these years. So, and see how <coughs> data in Finland compares to global trend. So, the global temperature has been increasing about 0.8 degrees between the same time period, and it is said to be caused by human activity. And because Finland is in northern latitudes, it is expected that temperature increase here is higher than on average. But then again, Finland is quite in a quite rare position We're between the Atlantic Ocean and the continental air range, so the weather is quite variable and the temperature thing was rather noisy. So we have to do some more complex analysis to find out the properties of the data. And this is actually the same time series Hannah already showed. There's the mean temperature in years, and this is <coughs> the seasonal variation within the last 10 years. And as you can see, the seasonal variation is really high. There could be more than 30 degrees difference between the coldest and the warmest month of the year. So these things have to be taken into account. And again, the variation between years is quite high. There might be a difference of 5 degrees between consecutive years. And if we compare to global temperature change, there's, there's a different scale. They have tried to make more clear that there is a significant trend. And then from this figure, you can see where the highest increase in temperature has happened. And Finland is here, and it's in red. So that means that temperature change should be quite clear also in our data. And then something about time series analysis. I'm using a slide here, but it's OK. 
Okay. Just here we can see the structural time series. There's the observations are these blue spots. And then there is some kind of trend usually in the data. This is measured in Kaisen in Helsinki. That figure is from web page Marco Line. There's also, if you want to see some more examples about this type of this, you can go there. And there's first, there is a trend which has been within these nine years quite constant. So, no increase in Kaisen within last nine years. And then there is seasonal variation, and the third component usually presented is the random error time, which is expected to be just random noise if the other components are taken account. But that's not probably this figure. And this is what we are now trying to do, decomposing the whole time trees in Red Finland. And for this, we apply a dynamic linear model. And we didn't have any expectations what kind of trend we will have in the data, or do we have any kind of trend. But the model is able to estimate all the components at the same time, so there is no cumulative error in that. And the model structure gives quite simple decomposition of the variability in the data. But the method with this, so you can detect and quantify the trends, but with this approach, with this simplest approach we used here, we can say what's the causal effect. So what has caused a possible change in temperature. We could do that if we had more data, for example, greenhouse gas data or something like that, which we could add to the model, and then we could test if there's some significant effect. But now we have all this temperature time series. And the analysis is not limited by some, some assumptions used in classical time series analysis like area borders. Like that. So, this name dynamic linear model comes that the model is basically linear and at each time point. So, it's linear regression where this all coefficient can depend on time. So, in each point it's linear, but in the whole time series it might look not so linear. Any kind, actually. And these are state based, so called state based models that as long as there are some unknown state of the system and the observations are images of that state. I'm not going into details on this. I have like 10 minutes left, so I'm trying to get the results before the time ends. So, but then the temperature series, like many other climate time series, have some long range dependencies, cycles, like seasonality, and these all can be taken account with the same model. So we're not making errors on that. And also, we could add some external components, shocks like volcanic eruptions or something like that, and they count their effect also. And this is the equational form of the model. There's observation at time point t, and there's the components are at mean level, seasonal component, some other component, let's take a the operations, and, and then the error term. So, quite simple model for not so simple data. So, we had almost 2,000 monthly observations where we picked the model and we took account the 
single variation with this dummy type CISL component, so each month has its own estimate or variation. And we also tested for long range effects. It has been seen that in cold block temperature there are longer time oscillations, like 60 to 80 years. And we also see that there is some effect in the 60 year, 66 year oscillation, but it, didn't, it was not that strong that we should take account in the final analysis. And we also tested for sunspot cycles, probably to right here, and that did it also affect significantly the finish time series. And this is what we got. There's the, again, the annual means, and here's the trend we feed it to the data, and the shaded area is 95% confident lead from the analysis. And as you can see, because of the variation in the data, the confidence limits are quite wide. But you can still clearly see that there is a significant <coughs> increase in temperature in Finland within this time period. And it, it also says, oh, this is quite small, but you can also see <coughs> decadal averages, and here is this is also seen in global analysis that there was some pause in temperature increase starting from late 1930s and it ended around 1970s. And then the increase started after that even stronger than before. So if some of you have any explanation why that happened, I'd like to hear that. We don't know it. And then we also made some seasonal analysis. Uh, unluckily for Finnish people, the temperature increase does not happen <coughs> in summer time. In July and August, the temperature is almost constant, but the increase happens in mostly in winter months and late autumn, like November, December, January. So we will get four winters and not so good summers with this kind of changes in our temperature. And if you go to closer look, for example, for June, we can say that the trend is almost constant, slight increase here, but not so clear and not statistically significant, but in December there is quite huge increase actually. It starts from around minus 12 degrees and ends up in about 7 degrees. So we will get warm winters in the near future if this trend continues. So the results also in written form. So the temp total increase in temperature was about 2.6 degrees, but then the confidence limit for the increase is quite high. But with this we get about 0.16 centigrade <coughs> per decade for the magnitude of temperature increase. And the same sort negatively in the mid 90s, but then within the last four years, the change has been around 0.3 centigrade per decade. So we get quite high number if we continue like this. And uh, as I said, the increase was highest in late autumn and the winter. So we found that there is a cyclic trend. And this is in line with the global trend, a bit higher, which is caused our northern location. 
and this confirms the assumptions for that. But then some future work related to this. We're planning to combine the temperature <coughs> and precipitation time trees and also study the role of aerosols in the changes in temperature and precipitation and also if we get the data and also some funding, I would like to also see the effect of greenhouse gas and other atmospheric pollution to these changes and see what causes which change because these all are related to each other. But now we have quite a powerful tool for that. So, thank you for your attention. Specific questions to something, please uh, ask that in, in a few minutes. Now, before we go to the uh, group working again. But there are some references related to this. I've almost forgot to show them, but we can see more from these. Yeah. A very obvious question is here is that could you use your model to predict the temperature in the next coming decades? which are relevant for most applications and the greenhouse forcing is not like uh, contributing that much. Well, we can make predictions, but I'm not sure how reliable they are. We need some additional data to confirm the predictions. So if we can relate some other variables like greenhouse gases or other pollution to this temperature data, then we can make the prediction better. If we, we can also always con continue the trend line and make some bigger <coughs> confidence limit for that, but that's a quite good way to do it. Yeah. So that if you look at the uh, minimum and maximum temperature, that could be more important for permafrost than the glacier. Yeah, that's true. We're also thinking about that, but. This study we used only mean temperatures, but it would definitely be worth looking also means and maximums. And that's using those uh, uh, this projected future warming during the next few decades is about the same as what you have found during the past few decades, even based on on kind of modeling. One thing that comes up when you look at observations over such long periods is that the observational practices change, the instruments change, and the people who talk the observations change. To what extent do you have to question that sort of thing here? For example, if you know, the actual observing stations were removed or changed altitude, so that you're systematically measuring something different from one period to another, and how could that affect things like Trend. Well, things like the trend, it doesn't actually matter that much because most of these changes are taken account in the construction of the created data set. But then it, of course, affects the confidence limits of the prediction. This is one reason why the confidence limits of our prediction is this wide. Because there are uncertainties in data. And what do you say? This one possible cause for that. Maybe Hannah. Um, yeah, 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 I was just uh, about to add that the multi temperatures that were used to create the grid data, they were already homogenized. Mm -hmm. So these issues were at, at least tried to <laughs> take care of. Uh, maybe one question to Hannah. Uh, in your slide, you showed the impact of network density on average uh, temperature, like 6, uh, 20. How you select those stations? Uh, so those were the stations, like the six stations, they were the, the ones that were 
uh, operational in the very beginning. So those were the stations that we started with. And then uh, for evaluating the uh, bias that comes from the such a low number of stations, we uh, so we calculated the mean temperatures with that station combination and then <coughs> compared to the to one that had been calculated with the, a lot of stations. So we the station combinations they came from the history. So they were just combinations that were there. And then 